Kate is a graduate student here in the biology department at USU. And she is working on a new type of bug, at least relatively new to Utah, which is the brown marmorated stink bug. And she's going to, she's, her whole graduate program is focused on this pest and where it's being a problem in Utah and how to control it. So I'm going to turn the time over to Kate to share what she's found so far and, and give you some information that way. Awesome. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. Perfect. Yeah, so I'm talking about one more pest um, to be worried about or not worried about. We'll talk about it. Um, so this is the brown marmorated stink bug. Um, that's quite a mouthful. So I'm going to call it BMSB. That's pretty commonly used. Um, so this is a stink bug that's invasive from Asia. Um, it causes pretty severe pest um, damage in all sorts of crops and orchards, nut, fruit, small and urban farms. And some of the reasons that it causes um, such severe damage and has so many uh, advantageous traits is it can feed on so many different host plants. I think the list is at, we're counting about 300 host plants, I think at this point um, throughout all the literature. It's also capable of flying quite the distance. It can fly up to 70 miles a day. And then it takes advantage of human structures like buildings and homes to overwinter. And so I, I've actually found some of these in my house this past winter. I didn't see any recently, but they are out there. And so we have a few native stink bugs that look a little bit similar. So I just wanted to give a brief identification um, information for you. So one of the clear things you can look for to make sure you're seeing a brown marmorated stink bug and not one of our natives is these white bands. They have some double white bands on their antennae as well as on their legs. And then they have kind of this striped outer edge um, along their wings. Um, and then where you're gonna see these guys, like I said, they overwinter in buildings and then they'll come out um, in the early spring and start laying eggs. You might see them um, in your house over the winter, but then in crops starting um, late April, early May. And then throughout the summer, they'll feed on crops. And then you'll probably see them um, around October heading back in um, some aggregations, maybe on buildings and heading back inside. So BMSB was accidentally imported um, from Asia to North America in the late 1990s. It quickly spread um, from where it arrived in Pennsylvania. And then we first detected it here in Utah in 2012. 2016 is where we started seeing some establishment in Utah, and then 2017 was the first reported crop damage. Um, and at this point, BMSB is fairly established here in Utah. Um, we have it in quite a few counties. Um, so not a new pest, but one we're still looking at. And then I stole this lovely graphic from stopbmsb.org. They have lots of great information. Um, but here are some of the different categories of risk. Um, we are obviously in the grape and berry section, so those are kind of the ones I wanted to focus on today. Orchard crops like peach and apple and pear are generally the most susceptible to BMSB, um, but I'm going to talk less about those today and try to focus a little bit more on what you guys would be a little more interested in. So grapes fall within this high risk category. Um, BMSB has been found infesting wine grapes in a couple of states, New Jersey, Oregon, Virginia, and the feeding damage specifically can cause increase in berry drop. Um, it can cause soft or discolored berries, some necrosis there. Um, so those are some things to watch out for. BMSB is a piercing sucking feeder, so it will stick its little proboscis with its stylus sheath into the fruit and cause these little discolorations there. Um, next up in the moderate category, you have your blueberries. So damage can, again, cause some discoloration, some sunkenness, um, and then some severe cases with lots of feeding, some shriveling, and really just disformed fruit. It can also cause some premature ripening, which can obviously be problematic for growers. And then caneberries like blackberries and raspberries, um, again, can cause some necrosis and decay. Um, an interesting thing that I learned about recently is one of the issues here 
is also that the berries can absorb the stink bug stink. And so that can affect the taste and the flavor of the berries. Um, also, if you have stink bugs pooping on your berries, that can affect the taste as well, and make them much less appetizing. <laughs> so there's always that to look out for. Uh, this is a photo of a BMSB and some damage on a service berry. And then low risk, um, not much damage has been recorded on cranberries so far. And then as far as strawberries and some of those other fruits go, um, either more research is needed or there hasn't been a whole bunch of damage reported so far. StopBMSB.org has some wonderful fact sheets um, specifically on this fruit damage and the different categories if you want to learn more about that. So with this pest being so damaging and feeding on so many different things, it's been quite the challenge to manage it. Um, the most common way has been to use broad spectrum insecticides. However, these are not the most effective. Um, in some cases, growers have had to increase their amount of insecticide up to fourfold um, just to have an effect, which obviously ends up being pretty costly for growers and the environment. Um, and so using these broad spectrum insecticides um, also has um, disruptions where we're killing off other beneficial insects, causing some um, insecticide resistant to other pests and having secondary pest outbreaks. So not the best option, which leads us to the idea of biological control. And so that's where we want to use BMSB's natural enemies to control it. Now, this is quite the chart. Um, again, I didn't make this chart, it's from Stop BMSB. They have wonderful graphics, um, but I wanna kind of focus you in on this section where we're talking about the egg natural enemies. Um, the reason researchers tend to focus on these um, egg predators, specifically these guys down here in the bottom that are called parasitoids is because they're a lot more host specific than some of the other general predators. And so they can be a lot more targeted to biological control. And so I'm gonna be talking about these little tiny parasitoid wasps. And when I say tiny, um, they're about two millimeters long or the width of a nickel. Um, when I tell my mom I research wasps, she thinks I mean paper wasps. And then one day she came into the lab and I showed her and she says, those aren't wasps, those are gnats. Um, so when you're looking for these guys out um, in your crops, they are little bitty guys. Um, you're not gonna probably recognize it as a big old wasp. Um, but anyways, these wasps will uh, actually lay their own eggs within the stink bug eggs, and they will use the juvenile stink bug for nutrients as that wasp develops, and it'll eventually emerge out of that egg as a full-grown adult. And so here in Utah, we have a couple different genera of parasitoids that are known to parasitize BMSB. Um, these are Anastatus, Telenomus, and Trisulcus. And a lot of research has been done on these guys in Utah. And sadly, they are not great at parasitizing BMSB. Um, their emergence rates are only about 0.5 to 3.7. And so even though they have low amounts of parasitism, they were our best options up until recently. And in 2019, we got to uh, discover this wasp called the samurai wasp here in Utah. So its scientific name is Trisulcus japonicus, um, and its common name is the samurai wasp. In Asia, where the stink bug is native to, this wasp controls it very well. BMSB is much less of a pest to there because there's such strong control by these wasps. Um, and so researchers actually had this wasp in quarantine looking at research to release it as a biological control agent. Um, and then we actually saw it show up on its own. Um, they thought it might've gotten out of quarantine and everyone was a little worried, but um, through genetic testing, they found that it showed up on its own, probably through some BMSB eggs, the same way BMSB got here. Um, and so uh, the inventive populations were found on the East Coast in 2014, and then it's been popping up in other states since. And in 2019, like I said, we found it here in Utah. And so far, some early research by my colleague has shown much better parasitism rates. Um, and so that looks a lot more promising, but there are some potential issues for this wasp here in Utah. 
some research from uh, Avila and Charles. Um, this was produced in 2018. They did some geographic modeling. And here in Utah, we're in this unsuitable or marginally suitable area for the wasp to be able to establish. It is much more arid here in Utah than in Asia, and we get these hot summers, and then we also have pretty heavy snowfall. And so it's fairly different from the wasp's home range, but we still found it here, and it's sustained itself a couple of winters. So it's interesting, um, but this kind of leads into my research and what we need to do to help sustain this wasp. And so where is it in Utah is kind of an important question. So this is part of my research. We first detected it in Salt Lake City um, back in 2019. And so you can see here on this map, there's kind of a hot spot of little dots around that area. Um, it tends to gravitate towards these urban areas. And then we found it uh, a sprinkling of other sites since um, all the way up into Weber County and then down south into Utah County. And so I've shown you here, this is your um, test before you get to go to lunch. You have to look at this yellow sticky card and see if you can find the wasp on the card. <laughs> so I'll cheat, I'll show you. So here are two of those little wasps on there. So they're just these little tiny guys which can make processing the cards um, quite <laughs> time consuming, I guess I'll say. We have to, we put out these yellow sticky cards for about two weeks at a time. We come pick them up and then we get them under a microscope so we can see what's on them. Um, and that's because without the yellow sticky cards, they are pretty hard to find. Um, they're so tiny, you're not gonna just spot them flying around. <laughs> And I guess this is why I'm grateful to my technicians for helping me to process them. So I mentioned that we've seen a trend towards the wasps in the urban areas, and you can see that they're kind of clustered around those urban areas. We see less in the more agricultural um, areas. And one of the theories for why that might be is that the urban sites have more ornamental plants. Um, and those ornamental plants provide more diversity and more floral resources for the wasps. These wasps, not a ton is known about their feeding, but we know that they eat um, and feed on pollen and nectar from plants and that they need fairly small flowers to feed on. And so having that diversity um, through ornamentals can be pretty beneficial. Um, they also benefit in terms of habitat. And of course, floral resources always have additional benefits um, for growers in terms of attracting other beneficials and helping with soil conditioning and stuff like that. So that leads to my research objective that I wanna talk about today. So I am looking at determining if having different ground cover in orchards has an effect on the amount of both the native wasps I talked about and then also this exotic samurai wasp. So for this study, we set up an experiment and we took 24 sites throughout Utah, all the way up into Cache County and then down into Utah County. Um, and we had eight of each type of site. So we categorized these by floral, turf, and bear. So when I talk about floral, I'm talking about orchards that have been left unmanaged possibly that have weeds, wildflowers going on. This one, this category also included orchards that have been purposefully strip cropped or border cropped um, to have those floral resources. The term turf we used for orchards that were mowed and managed, well-kept grass, and then bare was anything that was not growing anything. So we just had dirt, it was cultivated, managed, um, no resources for the wasps to use there. And so every two weeks throughout the summer, we swapped out these sticky cards and brought them back to see what we had on the cards. So we are still in the process of processing all of these, but I'm gonna show you some preliminary data we have. So on this graph, I'm showing you the average number of parasitoid wasps per card, and that's represented by these solid lines. Um, and we have the different colors for each site category. And so looking at these lines, it's not quite what we expected. We were a little surprised, but we're actually seeing more of these wasps overall at the bear sites. 
Um, and so looking into this a little bit more, I've included on the right axis, we have the average number of BMSB. And so these are the dotted lines. And so you can see there's a little bit of a trend going on here where there are more uh, BMSB at these bear sites. And possibly that is why we have more wasps at the bear sites. And so you can see the trends kind of following a similar amount of wasps um, correlated with the number of BMSB. And so this graph is for all of the trisulcus in general. So that includes both the exotic and the natives. And then on this graph, I wanted to show you just that Trisulcus japonicus or the samurai wasp. And so you can see again, the bear sites are doing, um, have more numbers than the other sites, except for this interesting spike we have here in the floral. Um, so I'm still looking into this. It's interesting. We'll see this is uh, deployments one through seven out of 10. So I'm interested to see if this peak holds true um, for the floral sites and see if there's a seasonality effect there or kind of what's going on further. Um, something else that we got to obtain from all the sticky card data is pretty simple, but good to know is just what wasps we have and kind of their prevalence. And so here's a number of species that we have. I would give you common names, but a lot of these wasps don't even have them. Um, but kind of the point I want to make here is that this Trisulcus uschisti makes up about 74% of what we find on our sticky cards. Um, so about three-fourths of everything that we find is a Trisulcus uschisti. And then our samurai wasp, our exotic, makes up about 4% of what we're finding. Um, here's a photo of Trisulcus uschisti. Looks the same as Trisulcus japonicus, unless you know what you're looking for. Um, but the amount of Trisulcus japonicus or the samurai wasp is a pretty small amount. Um, and so you might think we want to focus our efforts maybe on this more prevalent Trisulcus uschisti for biological control, but I'm going to show you my argument against that. Um, and so here's some data that actually came out of one of my other objectives that I'm working on. So not from sticky cards, but for this other study, we actually put out a bunch of egg masses, a total of 92, and we left them out in the field where we knew that there were some wasps and we picked them back up and got to see what was happening there. And so what I wanna point out from this study is that out of 92 egg masses, we saw about the same attempts to parasitize out of Trisulcus uschisti and the samurai wasp. So out of 92, we had six by Trisulcus uschisti, and five by Trisulcus japonicus. And so they're going after about the same amount of eggs, but then I wanna point out this emergence rate. And I kind of alluded to this earlier with other research, but we have some more to back it up now. But Trisulcus uschisti, out of all of the eggs, only about 1.8 of them were actually able to emerge successfully um, and survive as adults. And then, for Trisulcus japonicus, that number goes up to about 78%, which is um, a lot more optimistic for them in terms of being a biological control agent. And so why we see this is just that the bottom line is the samurai wasps have evolved alongside BMSB, and so they have a better ability to get past that stink bug's um, native, their defenses, and then our native wasps here in Utah aren't quite used to it. They don't have that ability to get past the defenses and usually their attempts are, I guess, wasted in terms of them being able to reproduce and control the stink bugs. Um, I have a couple images here on the bottom left. I'm showing you a Trisulcus uschisti. The females will sting the eggs and then sit on the eggs and kind of guard them, make sure no one else gets to sting them. And so these eggs, um, have been attempted to be parasitized, but you can see the little black triangle on them. That actually means that stink bugs are going to come out of them. Usually when we have egg masses stung by Trisulcus uschisti, we see one to three wasps emerge out of them. Um, compared to Trisulcus japonicus, um, this egg mass that I am showing you a picture of is fully dark, and so it's likely that it will have full emergence, and we usually see um, anywhere between 60 to 100% emergence out of those egg masses. 
Um, and so that's kind of why my research and a lot of research um, throughout the US is focusing in on this Trisulcus japonicus or the samurai wasp rather than our natives. Um, so to wrap this up, um, we are still processing data. Um, like I said, we have a couple more deployments to get through. We also um, have, well, I have a lot of analysis to get done. So I'm showing you some differences between the highest numbers and that bear orchards have the most, but we need to run a lot of statistics and a lot of analysis on that to see if those um, differences really hold true. And with that, if there are other correlations going on, um, I kind of alluded to and suspect that we have some other factors like the number of BMSB in the area or where these sites might be locationally, um, or even maybe the orchard fruit going on at the orchards might have a bigger effect on the number of wasps rather than just this ground cover aspect. So looking into some of those other factors is definitely on my to-do list. Um, but an overall takeaway that we got to reinforce from some of my research is that Trisulcus japonicus is very successful at parasitizing um, the stink bug and we want to use it. We want to sustain it in any way we can. Um, and we will continue to um, sustain and look into our Utah natives, but they have fairly low success rates. Um, especially where we're talking about 4% <laughs> abundance of Trisulcus japonicus compared to 74% abundance of Trisulcus eushisti and they're stinging about the same amount. So take that into consideration, um, kind of a good takeaway there. And then lastly, to wrap things up a little bit, I wanted to talk about some things that you guys can do um, as growers to help encourage this wasp. So in general, using fewer insecticides Specifically, the spinosad and sulfoxifor have been identified by some other researchers as particularly harmful to these wasps. Um, they showed a, quite a bit of um, death when they did some trials on that. Another thing you can do, while this may not be proved true by my data right now, is to increase floral diversity. Um, so, increasing or letting your wildflowers grow having ornamental flowers nearby, stripping and border cropping um, is always beneficial to not only my little parasitoid wasps, other parasitoids for other pests um, and other beneficials like pollinators, um, always good things to have that diversity going on. And then lastly, if you see a parasitoid wasp, um, if it's sitting on an egg mass or just flying around, if you have see a dark egg mass, your best bet is to just leave these alone let them do their thing, don't remove it, don't mess with it, it'll do its thing and hopefully you'll have more parasitoids soon. And then lastly, I'd just like to thank all those that contributed. I have lots of great funding sources and lots of good helpers on my research and I couldn't do any of this without them. And as a part of that, um, I have funding through WSAIR and um, for that funding, they asked me to do a survey after I present. And so I have a little QR code for you here. I can also drop a link in the chat to help out um, if you can't get that QR code to work. But if you guys could fill out that survey for me, that would be super helpful and I would really appreciate it. And with that, I can take any questions. Thank you, Kate. That's great information. Um, and and. For those that, like Kate said, for those that can't access the QR code, she is going to put a link there. So she'd still like to have you. I know if several of you have said you struggle with or are not able to access the QR codes. So there's a few questions here, Kate, that I want to, to, to throw at you here. Um, why is the BMSB egg parasitism rate in the field so low? Um, for a specific wasp or... The question is, why do you know. think the BMSB egg parasitism rate in the field is so low? That's the question. I, okay. I'm not sure. um, I guess I have a couple answers to that one. <laughs> um, for our native wasps, the parasitism is probably pretty low. 
Um, these wasps use special chemical cues to find the egg masses. And our native wasps don't have that same ability to pick up on the cues. And the egg masses are just not quite as attractive to our native wasps. And then for the exotic wasps, um, we're seeing higher levels of parasitism. And I think that's just because our populations of this exotic wasp here in Utah are pretty low. They're pretty minimal compared to other places and especially compared to its um, native range. So it, there's just not enough of them to be, um, I guess, taking a dent out of the population yet. Okay. Uh, another question has to do with mulches. You talked about ground covers and whether or not those are effective. Ha are you looking at using, say, wood chip mulches from a arborist or something that, and whether or not that influences the, the populations? I specifically haven't looked into that too much. Um, my colleague and I know some other researchers have tried to look into um, leaf litter versus bark and mulch to see if that helps with these guys overwintering. Um, and <laughs> unfortunately, the research hasn't gone super fantastic just because the wasps are so tiny that if you put them in mulch, it's hard to tell what happened and who died um, or who lived. But there's definitely, we know that they need um, those resources to overwinter. And so a lot more research needs to be done on that. But um, I specifically didn't look into it this time. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next question, are, the, are there times the day when the wasps would be more or less active so that maybe if you did need to use an insecticide, you could target a time of the day when the wasps are less active and maybe impact that population? less? That's a good question. Um, from my experience, I've seen that they are pretty dormant when it's dark um, and they want to move around a lot less. I don't know if that's when you want to apply your insecticides, but um, they tend to sleep, I guess, when it's dark outside. And then I feel like I see them most active kind of um, mid-afternoon, kind of the hottest part of the day. Um, they very much like higher temperatures. So um, if it's lower than 75, I wouldn't expect to see much activity by them. So it'd probably be a little more temperature based than time of day, but that's what I've seen. Sure. So there's just, there's a bunch of questions coming up. So I'm gonna ask you to go on afterwards and answer some of these in the chat, but yeah. I'll just squeeze one more in. Is it possible to, or, to like, order wasp eggs to put out at your farm? Is that something that's available yet? Not yet. Um, I don't know when that might be. There are some other states that have tried mass releasings of these wasps. Um, and so far, it were unclear of the, I guess, uh, goodness of that strategy. Um, they're just, redetecting them as hard so we don't know if they're dying off or dispersing or what's going on there so there's not an option to buy them yet but i could possibly foresee that being an option in the future um but there's a lot of regulatory stuff in that area as well so sure 